I'm Julia Ritter. I'm the Museum and Library Director here at Antiochian Village Conference and Retreat Center. And right now we're in our museum indoor gallery courtyard. This is the Antiochian Heritage Museum. Uh, people often ask, what is Antiochian heritage? Uh, the word Antiochian comes from the city of Antioch. Antioch was a great city during the early years of Christianity. Um, it was also a bustling center of the Eastern uh, Byzantine Empire. We know from the Bible that the disciples of Christ were first called Christians in Antioch. Um, that's in Acts uh, chapter 11, verse 26. And so this place really was designed to house the heritage of that part of the world. Um, so it involves the Eastern Orthodox Christian heritage, as well as cultural, um, artistic heritage, and just a lot of the rich, rich, colorful people, uh, textiles, furniture, and, and icons, and all kinds of um, artifacts from that part of the world. We have actually featured in our courtyard a beautiful table, one example of the kind of uh, artifact that we have from that part of the world. This was made in Damascus. Uh, there are actually three of these in the world. Um, we have two of them. This is an inlaid wood dining room table with hand inlaid mother of pearl, that's shell, as well as silver detailing. This is silver in each of these little lines. Now this was part of the Syrian embassy in Washington DC actually had a very fancy dining room table with three of these tables in a row as you can see. And the gentleman who made them is right here from Damascus, Syria. So we're very fortunate to have these two, two of these tables, one of them here and one of them in our main lobby. Um, so that's, that's just a, a little sample. Um, behind us here actually is another sample of inlaid wood, a little bit more modern um, example of this inlaid wood, which is from that, that part of the world. Um, as we come into the museum, our first story actually takes us to the history of the Antiochian village property. Um, in this first case, actually, are three beautiful little paintings that are showing scenes from the camp. The camp property, you can see the outdoor chapel in the winter. Um, these are oil paintings by Ron Donahue. He's a local Pittsburgh painter, landscape painter. Um, this is one of the beautiful uh, paintings from, I think that was one of the earliest cabins on the property. And then the St. Ignatius Church. The reason we have these three paintings is we commissioned these in 2008. These three paintings basically lead us into this next story I'll tell you very briefly. Um, if we were talking earlier about the location of the Eastern Mediterranean and Antioch, um, as you can see, here's the Mediterranean with, with Italy, the boot of Italy, Syria and Lebanon over here, um, and the Mediterranean, the Atlantic Ocean, and here we have the United States. So this gives you an idea of how far we are, and yet also how close we are, because the history of this property actually connects these two parts of the world way back before we were even the United States of America. So actually, back in 2008, a nearby fort, Fort Ligonier, down in the town of Ligonier, it's about six miles away, they were celebrating 250 years of local history. That was 1758 when that fort was built. But back in 1758, Fort Ligonier um, was first built during the French and Indian War, and there were settlers here, actually, in this whole region of western Pennsylvania. And those people, a lot of them were, um, in fact, people connected to this property back then were Presbyterians from the Scotch-Irish heritage. Now, they were people who came, so the story begins really, in Ireland uh, with Scotch-Irish Presbyterians coming to the western Pennsylvania frontier. This was like the Wild West back then. Uh, Pennsylvania was very, very rural, um, kind of rugged, and people were you know, living a pretty rugged life here. They began to worship here on this very hillside, late 1700s and early 1800s. And so actually the exhibit that I'll take you through briefly is called East Meets West in Ligonier. And it basically connects the story of those early Presbyterians that first came to this region, connects them to who we are today, the Antiochian Orthodox Christians. So um, it brings us together through a series of steps wherein the first Presbyterians came here, 
and settled and worshipped on the land. Um, and then Presbyterians from America actually went over to the region of Antioch and did missionary work. And then those missionaries made friends and spent decades with local people in Syria and Lebanon and eventually invited many of their friends, their local friends, back to America in celebration of the United States' 100th anniversary, and that was in 1876. Here we are almost 100 years later, Americans who've been spending time in Syria and Lebanon, bringing local people over to spend about six months here celebrating the United States' centennial. This was a big party in Philadelphia, and lots of the world was invited, basically. So the, um, the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which was overseeing that whole Syria and Lebanon area, had a big booth, um, Japan had a booth, all kinds of countries came. And so the local people that came to, uh, to work on that booth became familiar with America and actually were some of the very first Antiochian Orthodox Christians that came here to the United States. So over time, of course, um, many, many years later, these people found their way to purchasing this property from the Presbyterians that originally owned it. So anyway, that story actually goes through a series of four people. Um, if you step over here, you can see one here, um, another one, two, three, four. And these four individuals I chose basically to kind of carry us through this story. Some of them are, are actually buried up in the little cemetery uh, at the camp property. Um, and then basically, we can start actually just by talking about Sarah Smith here um, and her husband, Eli Smith. Now on the other side, we have a panel about Sarah, but we're looking at her husband's information here. Um, she actually started the first school for girls in the Turkish Ottoman Empire, and her husband was busy translating the Bible into Arabic. Um, so these Americans really had this idea that they could help bring the Christian word of God um, to the local people. And they did it through education and through translating the Bible. Uh, but they also needed help here with the translation of the Bible. Uh, they got help from Boutras al-Bustani. He was, uh, he's our fourth featured person on this story. He worked very closely with Reverend Eli Smith. And he had an extremely talented way with languages. He spoke Greek, Hebrew, um, Aramaic, and Syriac as well as Arabic. And he was really instrumental in translating the Bible into Arabic. And he actually, the, even the one we use today in Arabic is thanks to his efforts. Um, now he was very close with the Presbyterians um, that were working on this translation project. And people like him were actually the people who were invited over to the centennial to come to the United States, as I mentioned, for our, our big party, our big world party. Um, and here's actually a print of that centennial in Philadelphia where the Pennsylvania display was in this little building here. There's a beautiful little fountain. And here was the Turkish Ottoman Empire, the Syrian Lebanese display, um, cafe actually. Um, they had a cafe with Arabic coffee and the local newspaper, Frank's, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, July 1st, 1876, talked all about the beautiful taste of Arabic coffee. <laughs> and uh, had images of that. And a lot of the uh, displays were you know, things like some what, what we see in the museum. Um, there were textiles and inlaid wood. This is actually the, the uh, Turkish display. Um, we also had a Brazilian cafe with Bethlehem and Palestine artifacts next to it. You can see here, these are all photographs from the centennial. As you can see, um, this was the Egyptian exhibit, which has a beautiful message. It says, the oldest people in the world sends its morning greeting to the youngest nation. So we were, we were just 100 years old. So that brings us full circle to the 100th anniversary of the United States, wherein these people first came from Syria and Lebanon to the United States. Many of the things on display were also you know, little Arabic coffee service, yeah, there were maps created of the whole centennial party. Um, there were medallions, and souvenirs, tickets to the centennial. And you can just imagine that those first Syrian Lebanese people, Arabic speaking Christians that came here to the US, um, really experienced something new for about six months. And many of them actually ended up coming here and, and bringing their families and beginning that wave that we know so well of early immigrants to the United States from um, Europe, uh, Eastern Europe, and Mediterranean. So that's the East meets West and Ligonier story. Uh, now we have a lot of the, uh, the Eastern part of this story heritage. Um, beautiful collection of icons. Many of them are from Russia. 
Um, you can tell these look like Russian icons if you know iconography. Um, there are also several from more of the Mediterranean region. Here you're coming up on those. Um, here we have Saint Ilian or Julian of Homs, which is a Syrian saint. Um, you can see some Arabic actually up in the corner. So this is a very interesting selection of our icons, not the full collection. But um, these I really love. They're actually uh, groups of saints that don't particularly relate to each other. However, it was very common for people to do a family icon. So they might choose all their patron saints, the names of people in their family, and have those all brought together in one icon and then you would hang it in your house. So these might have been um, members of a family. I love these two icons partly because they have many icons within each of them, but they share one icon in common and I love to look closely at this one. This is a very tender moment between the Christ child and the Theotokos, the mother of God. You can see his little hand reaching up around her neck and just caressing his mother in a very sort of tender moment. And she's gazing off to, we see in the distance, a tree. And this is uh, basically a foreshadowing of the cross. Of course, the cross was made from a tree, from wood. And it's basically a tender moment of sadness, also of joy, and the tree in the distance, you know, again, just what is to come. And again, that icon is repeated in this icon. Um, we see that same scene. You can see his little hand around her neck and the tree in the distance. This is the language of icons, wherein each part of the icon tells a very specific story, has a very specific meaning. And if you know the language of icons, you really can understand them. It's not hard, but it is sort of complicated. So the icon collection continues. Beautiful set of three icons of St. George a very popular saint in the Antiochian Orthodox Church in particular. And uh, again, this one has some Arabic at the bottom. This was actually painted, uh, originally written, we say icons were written uh, in Syria. That brings us to Saint Raphael. Um, he is actually a North American saint. He is buried here on the Antiochian village property, and these are actually artifacts from his burial casket, as well as the um, covers from his gospel book, Silver Covers. An Antimons hangs on the wall that was signed by him. This was signed in 1912. He lived among us until 1915. At the very bottom of the icon, you can see his writing in Arabic right here. Um, and that actually assigns this Antimons, which is basically an altar cloth for those of you that aren't familiar, um, which allows the priest to serve the liturgy. Um, and this was actually assigned to a priest who was going down into serve in Atlanta, and now St. Elias Antiochian Orthodox Church. Kind of tells the story a little bit of Antiochian Orthodoxy in North America because most of the type on here is actually from the Russian church, um, and yet it has the Arabic handwriting, and here it was in America. So all these cultures and countries come together here. So St. Raphael actually has a very interesting story and we have his thesis translated here from when he was a young man, he was about 20, in his 20s when he wrote it. Um, and that's something that if you're in our library, you can actually read the entire thesis translated into English um, from Greek, he wrote it in Greek. But over here we have a beautiful portrait of St. Raphael. And if you have an opportunity to visit the camp someday, you can see his gravesite there. He was a young man when he died. He was just in his 50s, but he served us here in North America for a good bit. Um, he was ordained, came here, and served as a priest in 1895 and became actually the bishop of North America, yeah, Bishop of Brooklyn in 1904. So he really did establish a lot of churches here in this country and also in, in all of North America. So one other highlight I like to show people is this absolutely miniature carving of lives of the saints and great feasts. These are tiny little carvings that would have been done probably by candlelight. Um, this was from the 17th century and maybe with some sort of magnifying glass. Kind of souvenirs from the Holy Land. Uh, these also incorporate the mother of pearl that you saw on the original table that we looked at. Scene of the mystical supper, the last supper, as well as some little Bibles with the covers that are intricately decorated. I'll end with actually a painting that is a modern piece of art. 
Um, this is by the artist Nico Cioccelli. Some of you may have seen this before. It was on the cover of the Word magazine in 2017, I believe. So this painting actually portrays St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was sent to his death by the Roman Empire because he would not denounce his Christian faith in favor. He was supposed to be worshiping the pagan gods and he refused to do so. They dragged him from Antioch to Rome and threw him into the Colosseum. And the neat thing about this painting really is that Nico Cioccelli, the painter, captures St. Ignatius' sort of joy and hope of Christ, um, hope of resurrection in Christ at the moment of his death, in spite of the dark, kind of sad and tragic uh, scene of death, it has that, that hope communicated in the painting. This is a, this is a uh, work of art to, <laughs> to appreciate, so thank you.